Good morning, everybody. Are you having a great time at GoTo? It's been amazing so far, I think. Um, so thank you very much for joining our session. We want to show you some cool things that you can do with Node.js and Sheets. My name is Franziska Hinkelmann. I'm a senior engineer at Google in New York City. I'm a Node.js core maintainer, and I'm also an elected member of the Node.js technical steering committee. I'm co-presenting with Anu. Hi, everyone. My name is Anu. I'm also a senior engineer at Google, uh, also in New York. We actually sit next to each other, um, which is how we spawned the idea to do this talk together. Uh, I focus on the G Suite APIs and the developer experience. All right, so let's get started with work less and do more. Why are we talking to you about Sheets? Well, Sheets have this big advantage that really anybody can work with a spreadsheet, not only developers. So Sheets, they, they are this universal language that pretty much everybody who you work with understands. Everybody can open it, read the data, edit the data, and then they can filter, they can sort, they can play around with the data and draw their own conclusion. So that's really neat because you're not restricted to just developers being able to work with something. Um, you probably know this, your typical workflow when you work with a sheet is first you need to collect your data, then you might have to do some da basic data prep, um, maybe adjust some timestamps or do translations of user input if it comes from multiple languages, once you have your clean data, then you can analyze the data very easily in a sheet, and the analysis usually goes hand in hand with data visualization. So if you have your data, it's very easy to generate charts in sheets, and then once you have your bar graphs, your pie charts, your diagrams, then it's easy to draw your first conclusions. Now, of course, as engineers, we could write code to generate a chart. Um, libraries like D3.js make it very easy to, to generate very rich information from data, but it's a lot more work. So when I want to iterate quickly, then Sheets allows me to just focus on the data and the metrics. Now, because of all this, Sheets is great for prototyping with data. So Sheets are a great tool for the output. We want to share those insights, um, all of the stuff that you can communicate on really quickly. But if we are being honest, uh, doing data input can be kind of a pain sometimes. So luckily, we can eliminate the manual parts of this task, and that's what we're going to show you how to do today. And we love Node.js. Uh, I sit next to Franzi, and she loves her work as a maintainer on the core. She loves teaching people how to use Node. And honestly, before I started sitting next to her, I primarily programmed in Java and Go. But then after learning how async await makes Node a lot more understandable, at least for me, um, I have been converted. So we're going to write an application today to work with Sheets. We're going to use this uh, Node client library from the NPM registry. This has a full-fledged API for talking to Sheets that we can use. Uh, Sheets is actually just one of the family of productivity tools that we call G Suite. Uh, this has you know, Gmail, Docs, Slides. And even if you're not using G Suite, you probably use similar applications day to day. And uh, just FYI, you can call these APIs for free. You don't need an enterprise account. And if you have heard talks on Google Cloud, uh, you've probably heard a lot of, about GCP, which is a Google Cloud platform. But Cloud itself is actually both GCP plus G Suite. So you use the same accounts. Um, these APIs are written the same way. So using them should look and feel pretty similar. So don't worry if you're not a Node person. We have client libraries, SDKs in many different languages. This allows you to use these services in the canonical way per language. So we have everything from .NET, Objective-C. I mentioned Java and Go earlier. So anything that can fit your stack. And we're going to focus on Node today. So let's quickly look at Hello World using the Sheets API. Um, this could be a script running locally on my laptop or a desktop somewhere. Um, what it does is it talks to the sheet service on our behalf to make modifications. So we start by requiring the package from the NPM registry. And then we initialize the sheet's client. 
And then right above, we see this long string, and that is the scope. So the scope is the level of access that we want to grant to the script. Um, we know that these files live in our drive, and if you know, I'm in the browser, I can see all my different files, but um, we just want this script to only be able to write to my spreadsheets. Uh, I get really nervous when I see applications, uh, when I'm installing them, start to ask for a lot of permissions. Like they want to get into my drive folders, they want to look at my email, maybe get my location history, my shoe size, mother's maiden name. Um, it is really bad practice to ask for more access than you need. Uh, and we really care about user trust. So we'll talk um, about best practices for auth later in this talk. So here we actually make the hello world call. Uh, we use this to actually insert the string. And then we specify where in the sheet we want to write to. So in sheets, we use uh, A1 notation, which is how you specify the location. So here we're going to write in the first column in the first row. And um, using this API, you are in control of what version that you're using. So we're using modern syntax with Node. And don't worry about trying to memorize any of the code that we show today. It's all up on GitHub already. So this is what it looks like when we actually run it. And if you remember from the last slide, there's a variable called spreadsheet ID. That is the same ID that you can find in your browser in the URL. So if you're going to bother to automate something, you're probably doing something a little bit more complex. You're not writing just one cell at a time, or maybe that is what you're automating. But um, the best way to make modifications is to use a type of method that we call batch update. And uh, batch update is actually common across G Suite APIs. Uh, it is a good way to uh, have your code work a little bit more efficiently. So why should you group your requests when possible? There are two main reasons. So the first is that every network call has a little bit of overhead, and batching those calls together will save latency. Um, the second is, is that this can actually help you reduce quota, but then also, um, we call these bat batches are treated atomically. So if you have a lot of writes that go in together, um, you never know if you're, you don't have to risk your spreadsheet being in an invalid state. So each one of these tasks could be a different type of write. So just think of batch update as a fancy list or a bucket for all different types of modifications that you make. Um, a lot of the same things that you can do in the UI. So writing data, adding charts, formatting cells, that sort of thing. So now that we have a basic toolkit for working with sheets with an API uh, with a node language, let's actually try to solve a real world problem. So I turn around and I see Francie looking at the insights tab on GitHub for the Node.js node repo on GitHub. This has the node core, which is at runtime. Um, if you go there now, you can see all the changes that are going into node 14. And she's very concerned with the health of the runtime and she's very metrics oriented. So the Insights tab is great for when you're tracking productivity, but it only gives you information about activity that's happening on GitHub. So the number of issues open and closed, the number of PRs. Um, but we know that when we're working, there's a lot of different factors that affect our productivity. So for example, if the product team changes requirements, uh, this could lead to a drop in velocity. Uh, if you have a lot of technical debt, and I believe there's been a few talks on tech debt at this conference already, um, that could be a persistent burden. And we know that good test coverage and continuous integration, like Jenkins for the node repo, helps people increase their velocity. What if just how well-fed people are dramatically affects their GitHub metrics? Francie wants to get a holistic photo picture into what helps people be more productive. So we're going to get a little silly today. Let's just focus on one of those questions that we're very curious about, but that's kind of hard to define. So we want to know if just how well people are fed affects their GitHub productivity. So this is a hard problem, not from a technical perspective, but a real world perspective. We have the contributors with their machines, we've got GitHub, we've got food, and we want an application to tie it all up together. So we're writing a prototype for automating gathering metrics so we could gather insights. So this is why we're going to use Sheets so we can quickly iterate and prototype with it. And we're going to write some node code. So let's start by breaking down the problem.
So my intuition is that we probably work better if we are well fed. But we care about metrics, so let's look at the data and see what that says. All right, so the Node repo is a very active repo. There are several hundred open issues and a few hundred PRs. And we want to know um, how many issues and PRs are open, and we also want to know how many are we closing, how many PRs are we merging. Luckily, we can get all this data from GitHub, and we don't have to go to the browser and read off this data every day. We just use the GitHub REST API. Um, they have a lovely client, OctoKit, when you work with JavaScript. It makes it super simple to get this data. It's, it's straightforward API, API calls. So we write a little script that does these four API calls to get us the number of PRs and issues. And now that we have the data, just like how Anu showed us how to write Hello World to a spreadsheet, we're now writing the data that we got from the GitHub API to a spreadsheet, just doing an um, update values call or, or a batch write. Obviously, if you go through the trouble of getting the data, um, you could console log it, and then you could copy the output and paste it into a spreadsheet. Um, but you would have to do this every time you want to update the data. It's manual labor, it's error prone. I don't want to do that. I much prefer having one more API call to the Google Sheets API that puts this data into my spreadsheet for me so I don't have to worry that when I copy and paste it that I'm like missing a cell or that I shift my data or something like that. So we can fully automate pulling the data from GitHub and pushing it into our spreadsheet. All right. What about the food data? Because we're interested in how does food affect what, what happens on GitHub. Um, so to find out how happy people are with their food, we did a little survey where we asked the node contributors in our office on a daily basis how happy they are with the food. You can tell this is very scientific. Um, and so when we have this data, um, if you've worked with Google Forms before, the results are always in a spreadsheet already, so we have our data already in here. If you work with anything else, um, just like with the GitHub data, just take the results and then push them with the right call to your sheet. All right, so now that we have both the data for GitHub and the data for the food happiness, now we're interested in whether there's any correlation that we can see in this data. If people are hungry, maybe they don't have a lot of patience and they just close issues. Or maybe if somebody ate too much, they work a little slower, don't merge as many PRs. What happens if people are so hungry that they get angry? Do they just like open issues because they're upset? Um, well, we have the data, and the best way to see anything quickly in the data is to visualize it, right? So here's our chart. Um, we'll look at what this chart tells us later. Um, I just want to focus on how we generated this chart. Because you probably know if you have a spreadsheet, you can highlight your data, right click, and say create chart. But again, it's manual. I would have to do this every time that I update the underlying data. I don't want to do this. Instead, I'm using an API call to generate this chart for me. So I never even have to open the browser. I just run a little script, pulls the data, updates or generates a chart. Um, the code for a chart, again, if you use the client libraries for the Google APIs, very straightforward. So we're doing an add chart request. We want to add a chart to our data. And then we just have to give it uh, the specification of the chart that we want. So we, have to, we can give it a title, for example, and then we have to put down the, the type of the chart. Um, we want a line chart, but you could do bar charts, scatter charts, those kind of things. Um, we also have to tell the, AP, the API what the domain of our chart is going to be. So in our case, that's the x-axis and it's the dates, um, what, how happy were people on each day and how many issues we have. And then the series, that's the data series that we want to plot. So just the data we got from GitHub and the data that we got from the form responses. And once we fully specified our chart, then we use the batch update request again and send this add chart request. So our architecture looks like this. We have several data sources, in our case, the GitHub API and what came in through a Google form. And then we um, do an a, a write API call to the spreadsheets API to put all this data into one spreadsheet. We do another API request to generate a chart. 
Okay, so we're gathering data, we're getting insights. This is, you know, a fun pr prototype me and Franzi are kind of hacking around with. But right now, it's only on Franzi's laptop. And what if I'm feeling a little uh, cranky in the morning and I accidentally spill coffee on her machine? Well, then we lose this. So we really need to host this as a service. So ideally, like anything else, we'd want client and server for this application. But it's really not those, just those two parts if we want all those principles that we care about for everything else, like high availability and fault tolerance. Um, if we go straight to the cloud, uh, it, you still have a lot of setup for putting things on VMs. Um, you know, when we start to have multiple servers, then you need a load balancer to distribute those requests. Maybe we have a cache somewhere in the mix to really make this a full-fledged app if this really takes off with our team. Um, it's a lot of different things to set up when we just kind of want to play around with this. So we're writing, we want to focus on our code, not setting up the infrastructure. So there's got to be a better way. And this is how we wind up at serverless. So uh, with serverless, you just get to upload your code to the cloud, and then your cloud provider figures out how to place and scale it on your behalf. Serverless doesn't mean no servers. It just means you don't have to worry about anything on those servers. Um, all we need to know is uh, we don't need to know those machines. Uh, we just have to pay for the time that our code is actually executing. And then open over there means that you get to use the languages, tools, and frameworks that you're already familiar with. So We've been talking about Node a lot today, which means that we're going to use the Express framework. But if we're using Python, we'd be using Flask, and so on and so forth. So Google Cloud Functions are narrow, focused bits of code that you upload to GCP, and then GCP figures out how to arrange it for you. And then you trigger them by events. And there are similar options on other cloud providers, like Lambda on AWS and Serverless on Azure, just to um, give you some more context. So there are two types of cloud functions, and we trigger them by two different types of events. So first we have background functions. So those can be triggered by different events, like maybe you upload a file to a storage bucket, or maybe you're listening to messages on PubSub. Today, we'll be looking at HTTP functions, which are more common. And you guessed it, the event type that triggers them is an HTTP request. They're good for processing data and uh, working with external services. So in the real world, you see them used a lot for third-party integrations, maybe to Twilio or Stripe. Maybe you're doing like credit card processing. So let's look at, uh, really quickly, hello world for our cloud functions. So I keep saying the word function. Do I really mean just a function? Yes, with two lines, we have a fully operational serverless backend. And then those request response objects are from the Express framework. And after you deploy this, you don't need any additional setup. You don't need any additional configuration. Once it's deployed, you get a fully qualified domain. You get an HTTPS endpoint. And then this actually dynamically generates the SSL and TLS certs for you. So now that we know Cloud Functions, we're going to wrap up all that code that we had in part one and then deploy it so we have a serverless backend that will do all this processing for us. This service will read the data from our sources and then produce a chart all while running in a data center somewhere in the cloud. So we upload the code that we had in part one with an exported function called GitHub chart, which is our main logic and does all that processing. So once it's done, we send back a 200, just like in Hello World. And here, we're actually going to send back the ID of the spreadsheet, which has that chart. So how do we actually deploy the cloud function? Uh, you can either use the CLI. GCloud is a CLI that you'll use at the command line to manage all your GCP tasks. And with functions, all you have to do is uh, just uh, give it the name of that function, and it'll pull everything up for you. So you can actually also deploy via the browser. Uh, what's great about Cloud Functions is that it picks up the package.json's, not the modules themselves, uh, which is good if, you're, if you ever have like a slow data connection. Say you're at a conference, you're not uploading modules back and forth. GCP downloads the dependencies in the cloud for you. Uh, also in the Cloud Console, which is the browser interface, you can actually edit and deploy right there. So if you need to make some minor tweaks on the go, um, this is also an option as well. So the code is in the cloud, but we still have to trigger it manually, which means one of us has to remember to kick it off every day. 
Um, we want to keep pulling in the data regularly to keep tracking our productivity over time. So instead of needing a human to trigger it every day, we want to schedule this. And then there's, this is a product called Cloud Scheduler. Uh, in my opinion, it's just big fancy cron in the cloud. Um, you actually use the same cron syntax as if you were just doing it on the command line. So we set up this cron job. And we have ours to set every morning at 9 AM. And you, all you have to do is specify that HTTP endpoint we got from deploying the function. So now we have a backend setup with a data collection job. And Franzi is going to take you through adding a client. So right now, we have an HTTP endpoint. So if you memorize this endpoint, you ping it, sending a GET request, or so opening it in the browser, and then you get a new chart. Um, it would be much more convenient, though, if we had a nice front-end client. So let's see how to add a client to this. Um, we build a little front-end that shows the chart. And when you click on Share Analysis, it uh, pulls in your data, updates the chart, and then sends this updated charts to your team members. Since we are sending out the data here, we're using the Gmail API. And just like in the back end where we have client libraries for Node.js, um, Google provides an SDK for, for browser JavaScript as well. Um, that makes it really easy to work with the API. So here it's just um, Gmail that uses that messages that send. You pass in the user ID and then as a resource the raw email, which can be plain text or HTML. So our front end or the cron job now triggers the cloud function. And then the function um, queries these other data sources for new data, writes that into a sheet, um, generates a new chart, and we email out this chart. This is really straightforward, right? Is that everything, though? So the big thing we left out here is authorization. And clearly, you don't want other people to send emails uh, pretending that they're you. Or probably worse, uh, you don't want other people to have access to your spreadsheets, which probably have sensitive financial planning on them rather than pull request numbers from GitHub. Um, you don't want other people to access your spreadsheets just because they figured out how to use the Sheets API. So how does authorization work in our application? In the front end here, we actually have a little authorize or login button. And when people click this button, then they're presented with the Google sign-in flow. So the Google sign-in flow is a secure authorization system that allows your users to log in with their Gmail account or Google account that they already have. And then they can authorize your application to do specific tasks on the user's behalf. So in this case, this end user, me, I allow the application to send emails on my behalf. And with the Google sign-in flow, all of this happens in a secure manner. Um, under the hood, this is using the OAuth2 protocol. So for OAuth2, the application always needs user consent before it can access user data. So the big thing here is that with OAuth2, your application does not get a user's credentials. You do not get your end user's passwords. Um, instead, you only, you always, your app always asks for consent from the users, and you don't have to worry about managing their passwords and credentials in a safe way. You're just like, well, I don't get those anyways. I have consent, so there's a lot less for you to worry about. Um, let's look at how OAuth2 actually looks under the hood. So it's often called three-legged OAuth. It's three-legged because there are three entities. Um, it's your application service, it's the Google service, but then most import importantly, there's the end user. <clears throat> so when your application wants to query the Google APIs, for example, because they want to send out an email, then um, they request a token from the Google server, which starts this sign-in flow for the end user. And if the end user logs in and then also consents to it, then your app gets back a token. Uh, application can validate the token. And then with this token, they can now make, the app can now make API calls, like sending an email on behalf of the end user. 
Um, the Google SDK, again, does a lot of this work for you, so you don't have to do this complicated workflow. Um, when you do initialize the Google client, you have to specify the scopes, and Anu mentioned that earlier. So for the front end, we set the scope to gmail.send, because all the app is doing is sending out the new chart to your teammates. It's not reading your emails or doing anything else with it. Um, if you set the scope in the sign-in flow, then it will say, do you allow this app to send emails? Um, it's specifically asking for Gmail that's sent. And when a user says, yeah, yeah, that's fine, okay, and then your app gets a token, if your app is now trying to use this token to write to the user spreadsheets, um, you'll get a 403 back from the Google service because clearly, even though you have a valid token, the user didn't consent to this action. They consented to this particular scope, so this token obviously is only valid for that and you can't use it for other API calls. Um, there's lots of different scopes. If you do work with the APIs, just have a look what different scopes are and pick the right one. There's one I specifically want to point out. It's the drive that file scope. So rather than giving an app access to writing to all your spreadsheets, with this scope, the application or the user only grants access to new files or to files that they explicitly give access to. So if you want to use an application like ours where you have one spreadsheet with the, the GitHub and the food data, this is a good scope because you don't risk that the application maliciously or accidentally reads your personal spreadsheets. Now, how does auth work in the back end? Because when the cloud function is triggered and then wants to write the new data to the spreadsheet, there's no end user involved. It's maybe the cloud scheduler, but it's, it's all happening in a cloud function. So how does this work here? Um, well, for the back end, we're using server-to-server -server authorization. And instead of a sheet that belongs to an end user, our spreadsheet resource actually belongs to the application. A little heads up though, usually when you work with resources like sheets or docs or slides um, and you have a real world application, you always want to use three-legged hours and have these resources belong to end users. If you think about it, if you have a real application with millions of users, you don't want your app to own millions of spreadsheets. You want every user or every team to own their own spreadsheet. So usually best practice is three-leg auth when you work with sheets and docs. Um, Server-to-server auth is called two-leg auth. You probably guessed it, there's only two entities involved here. There's no end user, it's the server app or the application server and the Google service. Um, for server-to-server -server authentication, you can make authorized API calls with a signed JSON web token or JIT instead of access tokens. And again, um, the, the Google SDK uh, makes it much easier for you. It handles all of this for you, so you don't have to create and sign your own JIT. So in comparison, three-legged OWASP is three entities, and it's on behalf of the end users. It always requires consent, and it's usually your best practice when you work with G Suite. Um, on the other hand, two-legged OWASP is for server-to-server -server authorization. It's on behalf of the application, and the resources have to belong to the application. Thank you for that comparison between the two different types of auth. Um, auth can get really confusing, uh, but if you are getting started with the G Suite APIs, you can go to the documentation, and we have quick starts that actually give you a lot of boilerplate code that you can copy and paste out. So um, as Francie mentioned, the client libraries actually handle a lot of this for you, so um, you can just copy and paste that out and get started in just a few minutes. Um, so what was the whole point in building this application? We wanted to get some insights. So let's see what we found out during our short experiment in the office. So we made a lot of different charts. We played around with all the different options and sheets. And uh, we wanted to show food satisfaction against GitHub metrics from our sample data. So we can actually see a little bit of a correlation. Uh, the left-hand side is the scale of the number of issues, and the right-hand side shows the happiness. And if we remember, our survey went from one to five. So here are some more charts. Again, if we pull out um, the signal from noise, we can actually see a little bit of a correlation. Um, again, more good charts. This one is closed issues versus and PRs versus food, so both of the things that we we're looking at. 
And after we write the code, we actually never have to manually open sheets again to get our insights, which can um, make this more accessible to other people who maybe other engineers who aren't using sheets every day, or if you just need to share this with other people who um, are opening lots of sheets every day. Now that we have this data, we can easily add metrics from other sources. You know, maybe we want to look at something like commute times. Um, we live in New York, which is notorious for uh, slow traffic. Uh, more realistically, we know that you probably have dashboards at your company. You're looking at uh, internal sources, traffic data, um, some sort of application monitoring. We just wanted to use uh, a watered down fun example to inspire you to see how you can play around with these things. So in conclusion, we stick to our hypothesis. Good food yields good code. And uh, we know correlation doesn't cause causation, but we have some data if we want to have this conversation with anyone else at the company. So we're going to tack on uh, one last thing to our system. Uh, one workflow that we actually see a lot in G Suite is automatically generating reports uh, with data. So people often have to make weekly, monthly, quarterly reports. Salespeople have to make customized re reports for clients. Uh, maybe we want to improve our good food trend over time, so we share this info with people all across the company in a doc or maybe a side deck presentation. Maybe you don't have to do this, but someone at your company probably does, and you can make them really happy by automating this as well. So let's look at a sample report for our GitHub productivity and see how we can automate this with the APIs that we've already been using. So if you've ever had to update reports yourself, maybe what you do is make a copy of the last one and then um, start to update the data. But that is also super tedious and error prone. Uh, what if we just create a template, and maybe you have templates at your company, uh, that uh, with placeholders for the data and other pieces of information to update, like we'll just look at the current date on the first slide. We're going to completely automate this. So first, we use the Drive API to create a copy of this for us every time we need to write a new one. And then we'll write some code using sheets and slides to uh, merge the most up-to-date pieces of data. So we use the Slides API to tie it all together. We start by initializing the size client so we can make modifications. And the syntax should look familiar. If you remember from the template deck, we have a placeholder for the report's date. We can make a replace text request to update it with uh, the new date, just as the code knows it. And the replace text write is you might have guessed it, a type of batch update. And we can do this for other placeholders throughout the deck, and you can even swap out images. So like if we had a slide summarizing the total number of pull requests, we'd be able to swap that in as well in the same batch update. So now let's look at how to add our charts. Uh, what's great about these APIs is that, similar to the products themselves, they're actually tightly coupled. So Slides has a specific API call for inserting a Sheets chart by its ID, its chart ID. So voila, by writing a script with these code snippets, we can have a way to generate reports with the most up-to-date data and without any human intervention at all. This could save you or your coworkers hours and hours of time. So we're going to start to summarize uh, what we built today. Let's look at the system that we designed now. So we designed a basic reporting system with uh, Node.js API calls to uh, G Suite and GCP. Our front end triggers uh, a function that fetches data from our external sources and automatically generates charts. And we have multiple ways to share that information, either using Gmail or generating a fancy looking report. At its core, whoops. At its core, we use Sheets as a data uh, collection and manip manipulation tool. So we had a blast uh, just brainstorming, trying to think of fun things that we could write over the summer to make this talk. And um, we hope that we've inspired you to take a non-technical problem and then try to solve it with the tools that you're using every day. Uh, our experimental app 
of investigates if lunch affects GitHub productivity. We know this probably isn't exactly what you're doing at your company, but maybe there's some data sources you can tie together and quickly prototype with. And uh, we really hope you have fun coding your next project, hopefully a node. Um, we'll see you on the issue tracker. And um, our completed code is available on GitHub. And feel free to tweet at us. And um, here are some links to get started. <laughs>